Uh, as a member of the COVID-19 Vaccine Education and Equity Project, INWA commits to advocating for access to and distribution of FDA-approved COVID-19 vaccines in a way that is equitable, promotes trust, and is consistent with sound medical uh, guidance. In joining forces with other leading organizations, we are confident in the ability to achieve our collective goal to assure the vaccines reach the most vulnerable groups, as well as those on the front lines of this pandemic. In the face of this COVID concern, AMWA is championing the need for vaccine trials to include and report on the safety and efficacy of sex and gender outcomes, to reflect specific therapeutic profile for women and racially diverse populations. We want a federal review process that is both robust and transparent so we can support widespread acceptance of vaccines, particularly for those at greatest risk. And we champion an efficient and equitable distribution of vaccines across the US and globally, which is why we're all here today. Because we have a societal imperative to overcome COVID-19 by encouraging everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible. However, there is work to be done to increase the trust and remove any obstacles to adoption by patients who might be hesitant. <clears throat> so ANFA, AMWA is grateful to have Neelam Argwal and Sarah Lynn Mark here to provide an opportunity for women physicians and all healthcare professionals to address common concerns and to give you a forum to get your answers, to get answers to your questions. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for this discussion, Neelam Agarwal, and I'd like to in introduce Sarah Lynn Mark, who has worked for four White House administrations and is a huge force in women and science and medicine. So thank you both for joining us and thank you all for coming to get these answers. Thanks, Jody, and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar tonight. Uh, Sarah Lynn and I were chatting prior to this webinar of how we would like to really conduct this and we really want to have a robust conversation about what's been happening and there's been a lot happening. So what we've decided is I'd like Sarah Lynn to give an overview of where she's been, what's been going on, and then we're going to start to delve into a lot of different topics related to the vaccine, distribution, our communities that we serve. And of course, we want to hear from your questions. So again, if you can put them in the chat box, that would be great. We'll get to as many as we can. So Sarah Lynn, it's great to see you. Um, why don't you kick it off tonight and tell us what's been happening, where you've been and what's going on with the vaccine. Great, thank you so much, Neelam. And I first want to thank the American Medical Women's Association for continuing to take such a strong leadership role during this pandemic. I think it's appropriate that we are having this event tonight. It's a good bookend for 2020, where we started off in March with many of our AMWA events, and then to have this tonight. And in a sense, we're ending in a somewhat optimistic note, because at least we're talking about therapeutics and we're talking about vaccines. When we came together in early March, we knew we were dealing with a novel virus. We didn't know really what we were up against. And I think it's through the leadership of AMWA engaging the global community, just not the United States, that we've been able to develop the type of relationships so that we can share information where we can ask questions. And we feel a spirit of, of camaraderie as we navigate a very difficult time. I've had the opportunity to listen in to several of our important briefings from the US government. Um, I know all of you are very much familiar with the, the demographics and the data that every day we hear about the number of cases in the US and around the globe. So I'm not gonna focus pretty much on that tonight, although that is certainly at the forefront of all our thoughts. We are now at a point where we have two vaccines that have received emergency use authorization that is very different than having approval. It's emergency use authorization. And what does that mean? It means that the FDA had decided through their independent panel of scientists and reviewers that these vaccines provided more benefit than harm during this emergency situation. The CDC has also come together through their uh, advisory panels to determine priority groups, because we know we don't have <clears throat> vaccines for every American, we have to prioritize. So through the C CDC developing its priority groups, um, which then go to the states where they can determine their priorities based on some of these recommendations, we develop a vaccination program. This vaccination program is one of the most robust programs that we've ever done in the history of the United States in regard to vaccination. I think we're all familiar every year with our annual vaccines, but this is quite different. Right now, we have two mRNA vaccines that have received authorization. And 
when we talk about an mRNA vaccine, this is a very different type of platform than what we've used before. So let me just set the stage for what we talk about the life cycle of a vaccine. We first look at the development of it. We then look at the manufacturing of it. And then we look at the distribution of it. And often it happens sequentially. So it can take many, many years before an idea goes from the bench to the bedside. We have basically done it in months. And that's because everything was happening simultaneously. And it was happening very quickly. We have reviewed data based on about two months of data after individuals were vaccinated. So again, short-term data, so we don't know the long-term effects. And this is a challenge. And I know it's a challenge for all of you tonight when you're dealing with your patients and trying to answer questions. We also don't know firmly the durability as well as the duration of the immune response. We don't know the immune response in natural infection, if you've had COVID-19, as well as when you receive these vaccines. The two vaccines that have received emergency use authorization are the Pfizer vaccine, which was authorized about two weeks ago, and then certainly Moderna, which was authorized um, and has just been released about two days ago, and we've begun vaccinating with both. They're very similar in the sense that they use an mRNA platform, which basically is using the genetic code of a stable protein on the virus. This is the spike protein, and it is encapsulated by a lipid nanoparticle. Um, and then it is in, it's injected into the body and it makes a protein, it makes a spike protein, which our humoral and our cellular immunity should be able to identify. So we're activating our B cells and we're activating the T cell immune system. The Pfizer vaccines are different in a couple of, and, and the Moderna vaccines are different in a couple of ways. First of all, I'm sure we've all heard about the issue of how do we freeze it? The Pfizer vaccine requires minus 9 to 4 Celsius. It requires special freezers, whereas the Moderna vaccine is about minus 4 Celsius, which is similar to what we have in our homes with refrigerators and, 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 and freezers. So it may be easier for more remote communities and outside of sort of more sophisticated hospital systems. Additionally, the Pfizer vaccine is given at 21-day interval, whereas Moderna is 28 days. They're trying to assess what the immune responses are in that window from the time that you are, remember it's two shots, from the time you're primed to when you're boosted. We believe with the Pfizer vaccine, within about week to two weeks, you start developing neutralizing antibodies where you may have efficacy against severe disease at about maybe 50, 52%. Hopefully after a week after you received your, um, prime, your, your booster, you should be up to around 95%. Again, it is age dependent. The older you are, you may not have the same robust responses. And so we think around 95 or so percent. Moderna, um, again, it's generally, it's a 28 day course. Initially it's thought that you may be um, developing your antibodies within that window. Um, the issue of neutralizing is to be determined. Um, and then about oh, around a week or two weeks later, after you've had your booster, you should be up at around 94%. Now, there is a question about side effects. You know, there's no perfect drug. There's no perfect vaccine. Everything comes with a risk-benefit analysis. And if you are going to have a vaccine that generates an immune response, you're tending to have side effects with it. And those are some of the traditional side effects I know we're all familiar with, such as nausea, vomiting, fevers, chills, myalgias, um, bone pain, headaches. Um, and what we have seen in the Moderna vaccine is about 90% of patients on average have some of these. About 17% can be a bit more significant where it's kind of impaired their ability to kind of get through the day, so to speak. But generally they resolve within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and we've seen this also in the Pfizer vaccine. Now the Pfizer vaccine has generated a lot of interest because of some of the cases of anaphylaxis. And again, very different than just traditional allergies to food, drugs, bee stings, allergens in the environment. This is anaphylaxis where generally individuals are required epinephrine. They're trying to determine what is causing this. And one of the thoughts is it might be an ingredient in the buffer, or excuse me, in the lipid nanoparticle. They don't think the buffer really has much to do with it. And the buffer is, again, you know, the sugars and salts that stabilize the vaccine. There's a comp compound called PEG, polyethylene glycol. It's a, comp a component that you see, for example, in laxatives. And they're wondering if some patients might be sensitive to that. So it is to be determined. I think one of the challenges is that one of the recommendations from CDC is that if 
if patients have had reactions to any of the components of the vaccine, then they should not get the vaccine. The challenge is, well, what are the components of the vaccine? And I've had some folks call me and say they've been to the CDC site and haven't seen it. So we, we can perhaps talk about that tonight, how we might be able to do a better job to make sure we get that information out there. There's also another issue, and, and Neelam, I know we're going to talk more about that. You know, remember, you have Oh, around 35,000, 37,000 patients who are research subjects, research participants who receive the vaccine. And now we're going to try to generalize to millions, hundreds of millions of patients or, or the public, participants in the, in the public, and billions potentially across the globe. And there is a dearth of data on pregnant women, women who are lactating and immunocompromised individuals. They did include uh, patients who had a stable HIV. Uh, but it's very different than when we talk about the immunized, immunocompromised state. And again, CDC had recommended that patients who have these issues be still vaccinated and that they have in consultation with other professional societies determined that to be um, a reasonable suggestion. But again, with the caveat that perhaps you should talk to your primary care physician, your obstetrician gynecologist to make the final decision. So hopefully we will talk about that. There was also some question about the way um, they recruited for race and ethnicity. There was involvement, but when you look at the general population, it really wasn't compa really comparable to what you would see. And we all know that the higher morbidity mortality across um, the Black and Latino populations and, and Native American and our indigenous populations. So that is an issue. There was also an issue on the younger groups and then on some of the older groups. And, and just as a caveat for the older individuals, as we know, as we age, there's senescence in our immune system. So some of the older populations, although they did find there was a response, didn't have a significant side effect. So that, in a sense, may be a blessing or not. We're not quite certain, but that's something just to keep in mind that people could be responding, but not have that same robust response that they would see in a younger population. So I think what I want to do, because I just, um, it, and I know there's so many wonderful questions, is to stop and hopefully a lot more we can tease out some of the granularity in our Q&A. Well, I, I think, you know, and thanks, Sarah Lynn, for that overview of where we are right now. Um, things are moving rapidly. Mm -hmm. And now that as the dissemination is coming and it's coming out in the field, we're beginning to see some questions come up now on logistics. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I... Um, wanted to ask you, since you know you have been a terrific spokesperson for AMWA along with many of our members, but where should people really be going? Because as you noted, CDC is not at times posting things um, as fast as we want. Um, our patients are coming to us in the offices. We're looking around for our information. So right now, where would be the go-to place first? And then what would be the second go-to in your mind to get information? Yeah, so this is so important. And you also, I think, bring up an important issue in that we're being bombarded daily by new facts and figures. I mean, for example, the whole issue in the UK right now, yeah. there is a new variant that may make this virus more transmissible, not necessarily more lethal. Right. Um, and it also may impact children more than what we expected. Um, and we now need to go back and do the surveillance to see how, what is the penetration in the United States and whether the vaccines will be affected to this new variant. Keep in mind, everyone, that viruses, as we know, mutate. You know, there's drift and then there's shift when you get into a pandemic. And what we try to do is, you know, develop a stable component to vaccines. So hopefully this vaccine will be effective. Hopefully the monoclonal antibodies that have been approved will be effective, but we have to be on our toes. The so CDC has created several different surveillance systems that a lot of our clinicians are gonna to have to be aware of, such as vSafe, which uses electronic text communication, the VAR system, the VSD system, all these lovely acronyms that we need to report. Because in a sense, we're kind of living in this giant experiment right now. It would be almost like a phase four trial if it had been approved. So we need to report. So I just put that out there. Um, the other component I think is important is I, I just can't imagine all our clinicians being inundated every day, every minute with questions because it could be nonstop. So I wish we could create from the public health departments around the country, 24 seven call centers, mm -hmm. so that when we could support people going through this, but we could also decompress our colleagues, right. because you, you, you have to take care of patients, you just can't be on the phone, trying to help take care of them, you need to be in the field, so to speak, doing that. So I think that will be important. I think what I hope will happen is, and I know it already has, 
is our professional societies have really risen to the task, certainly as there's been challenges in the government and getting effective uh, messaging out. So I think, um, and I know AMON has played a critical role here, is to, you know, perhaps even take a more critical role as we go through this, where there's frequent bulletins, you know, this is what we know, sort of the, the hot button issues, the newsletters, so we can get those, um, those topics out. And I think doing what we're doing right now, very quick check-ins, maybe monthly will be valuable and effective as well. Yeah, I think, you know, you touch on a good point about this communication and frankly, transparency. Yes, and that's from where I'm standing, and that's where I work, and that's where many of you work. If if we don't get this information out, and number one, recognize it's coming very fast. Number two, we may not know the answers. But if we don't stay transparent about the process and transparent about the data, we're going to have a real huge problem in the field about adopting who gets the vaccine. Um, so let's talk about the tier approach, Sarah Lynn, um, mm -hmm. about who's getting what, who gets what, when, and how. Um, healthcare providers, long-term care providers, you know, those are the top tier. Then right. in the middle, we start getting into our older adults, and then we broke up the older adults into older, and then less older. Mm -hmm. And then we went into the um, essential workers. How do you feel about that tier approach? And specifically, this is what I have got quite a bit. Um, I take care of my older mother. I'm the caregiver for my older mother. Right. Why can't I be vaccinated when she gets vaccinated? We are a dyad. I take care of her. What do you think about that and, and the, this tier approach? Do you think it's going to change? Do you think it's going to be modified? Yeah, so you bring up some important issues. I'm a geriatrician by training as well. And I know, you know, I'm looking at Eliza Chin as, as, as well. And, and so I know we, we wrestle with these issues. Um, the first group, the first priority were certainly healthcare workers on the front line, and then um, those who lived in um, long-term care facilities, congregate settings. And there was actually some discussion at the CDC um, Advisory Council on that, wondering, you know, will older individuals really mount those robust responses? Couldn't we just cocoon them? Um, and then it was felt, well, you know, considering that 40% of mortality is due to that age group generally, and it's certainly leading to the surge um, capacity issues. And then if you're vaccinating your healthcare teams, you might as well do it at the same time because of the challenges of getting some of these vaccines in. So that was part of the reason. Then there was a discussion about the next group, and it was decided 75 and above. And then going into essential frontline workers, such as our first responders, people who are doing transportation, who are keeping this country moving ahead. And then you get down to the low, you know, another group where it's 65 and under, and then individuals who are younger than that, but who have underlying conditions. So it's all contingent, it's supply and demand. Certainly the demand is there, it's just the supply. And you know, being able to get it out and to be able to distribute it and to be able to follow what's happening. So I always say the devil's in the details with distribution. You need to be really concerned about logistics. Um, I also have said, and, and you know, we, we smile about this in that the UK um, got the Pfizer vaccine before everybody. And I thought in some sense that was in a way appropriate. Um, in that, you know, I always think of the castle approach and our lines of defense. And I think Emma has come up with a lovely graphic about it. But, you know, the basic public health measures, you know, social distancing. Um, in regard to social distancing, I look at the moat. And then in regard to hand washing, I think of, oh, thank you, you got the graphic up. You know, it was hot oil poured over people. And then you had these high walls, and that's basically our mask. And then if you violated all those barriers, you then had guardians, you know, people who were trying to protect the castle, and you had hand to hand combat. And that technically would be the vaccine. And of course, some people would be going to, you know, there is injury to individuals who are fighting. There's some risk to that. So you have to have like all. All these lines of defense to be able um, to protect yourself. So, you know, even when we get these vaccines, because we talked about the duration, the durability, um, and then there are some who are non-responders, we need to protect um, ourselves and others. And we also don't know about shedding. Now, the Moderna vaccine, you may have some protection against asymptomatic disease, which could be very powerful. But, you know, I think, Neilan, coming back to your point, I think right now, because, again, in America, we're not used to this. It's almost like rationing in a way, prioritizing. We're not used to doing that. 
if someone needed something, we, we get it, we're able to do it. So it's really having to flip that switch in our minds about what is priority, not by who is more valuable to the population, but what is the biggest gain you're gonna get from a public health perspective to mitigate, to decrease some of the surge capacity, which, you know, sites, supplies and staffing, and we're maxing out. So what can we do to public, do a public health measure that can minimize reaching surge capacity? You know, I, I bring this up about this um, this caregiving issue here because mm -hmm. that really speaks to our diverse communities and you know the mm -hmm. multi generational. And this is where it hit hard when the when the whole pandemic hit. When the messaging came out, social distancing, stay away. You know, many of us mm -hmm. were talking to multi generational homes. How do right. you do that? And the fact that the messaging came out without understanding a, a large majority of our population really didn't sit well with many many different groups, it, it kind of shed a light that you really don't understand um, yeah. how, how we are living and our culture and our values. And I think this is, this is a message that we need to understand moving forward as we talk about vaccine distribution and how who gets what, and also keep saying the social distancing, wear the mask, these are the things as you said are so important. I do want to shift a little gear, Carolyn, with your impressions on the rapidity of how fast everything happened. Um, again, what I'm just I'm just sharing what I hear. I'm sure many of you in the audience have heard this. How could this happen so fast when everything else takes so long to happen? And if I'm in the clinical trial world and I know drug development, I know how long things take. I think you you really set it up nicely that this isn't traditionally going through those pathways. This was emergency use. But how, how would you approach patients who say, what corners were cut? How, the, how did this happen so quickly? I don't know if it's safe. It comes back to safety. Again, this kind of messaging, what should we do as AMWA, um, you know, working with ELISA, our, our organizations that we partner with, what should we do to mitigate and to really kind of tamper a little bit that fear that something was cut to get this out so fast? Yeah, and that's such a powerful question. And I know, you know, I I think about it too, you know, as I'm up to get a vaccine as well. And I've had antibody dependent enhancement to a prior vaccine, which um, was has very serious consequences. So don't take vaccines lightly for myself, nor for patients, nor for you know our community. Um, everything was accelerated in the sense that, you know, our phase one, phase two trials were done probably a bit quicker than usual. Um, the numbers of patients that were enrolled, I, I keep coming to patients, number of research participants um, was, was pretty strong. There, those, there was significant power in it. It's just, I think all of us would feel more comfortable if we had a longer follow-up period to actually assess some of the issues that we just discussed about and the long-term you know, implication and impact and will it play a role in decreasing asymptomatic spread and potential long collar syndrome. Mm -hmm. But I think what we have to do and we should never forget all this. These are important. And also some of the subpopulation demographics that we could have done a better job and not try to just overgeneralize and pray for the best is that we are in the middle of a very, very dangerous pandemic. Right. And it's so when you come back to it, it comes back to that risk benefit analysis. If you are able to do, as you said, to isolate yourself from the world and you can create that protective bubble, then you may want to wait and see what happens. You know, maybe you you can assess for yourself whether you are really needing it. But for many people, they don't have that option and they have to make that risk assessment to come out. And I think the thing that I did find encouraging is that there is post authorization pharmacovigilance, basically surveillance, mm -hmm. right. and we can be nimble. And we're seeing it right now. I'm actually in a strange way, glad that we're seeing this issue with the variant now versus two months from now, because I'm watching nations come together. They're doing the surveillance. They're looking at their you know, genotyping of what they've had. Um, one of the, I think Pfizer came back and said, if this is the case within six weeks, we can have a new vaccine. We can modify the mRNA code. That's the advantage of mRNA. You can alter it to meet what you need. So we're watching real time. It's just I think for all of us, it's uncomfortable because we're used to when something comes out that there is more certainty. Right. So what we have to do as a community, as a global community, as a community of female physicians is communicate 
And if we see something that we don't feel comfortable with, we need to report it, we need to speak up, we need to ask questions. Just because something's out there doesn't mean we are passive observers. This is something where we can take a stand. You know, and I think, you know, that brings up a really good point. Again, I'm going back to this communication because as, as we're seeing more data come through, you know, it, it has to be funneled down into bite-sized pieces that people understand. And I think yeah. the problem is now we're also in this information overload, misinformation yeah. overload. Both of these things are happening and people then either accept, embrace, adopt, or they go into lockdown, frankly, where I'm not mm -hmm. doing anything. And mm -hmm. I think AMWA, we have a really unique position here because we're not only with female physicians, but we are able to speak to families and children, mm -hmm. the whole household unit, whatever your household looks like, can be educated by us. Um, one of the things that is a real issue that doesn't really get spoken to uh, enough is involving our communities and our stakeholders in our communities with our messages. Yeah. So have you heard of any concrete measures that have come out from the meetings that you've been at about how are we engaging our communities on the ground with messaging with people that are trusted in the community that will ally with us and ally with other groups so what are your thoughts on that uh, to bring it from the ground up um, if you will well you bring up an important point and i think right from the beginning as i was doing some of the speaking engagements i talked about communication it needed to be clear it needed to be consistent with facts and it needed to be coordinated we we in the public health world made a mistake with masks. We didn't get those messages right early on and then trying to get people to pivot and adopt to the new message is almost impossible. So we, I always say here, we get one shot. We get one shot to get this vaccine right. So I think in that regard, there needs to be honesty and transparency, including about side effects. Now in regard to the question about tailoring it to be culturally competent, we have got to do a better job. I'm beginning to see some of it. I'm hearing on the airwaves now through, you know, some messages in Spanish, some from key opinion leaders in certain communities, um, going to churches, going to figures that are of, um, who have prominence in communities. I think that's all valuable, but I don't want it to be promos. I don't want any of that. I want people to actually have an honest discussion. I, what I would love to see, and hopefully this can happen, is just as we're doing it tonight, that communities coming together can do that, where they can ask questions. Mm -hmm. I don't want people just rolling up their sleeves. I want them to understand what's happening. I want them to understand sort of the risks and benefits. That does take work, but I think we have, you know, we have community leaders everywhere. In fact, everybody's a community leader. Just, you know, we can help get educated. I think if every M1 member could within their community have a discussion kind of like what we're doing with their groups and let that amplify and let that amplify kind of like what we've done with our giant round tables where everybody becomes an ambassador i think that could be really powerful i mean i know we all value hearing you know dr fauci and hearing our leaders speak that gives us reassurance but can people relate and that's where we have to come back down to where we are within our community and I, and I think, you know, again, I just want to stay on this point a little bit, because when you did, when you take a look at the two trials right now that have, you know, enrollment, you know, 10% mm -hmm. were African-American right. you combined, you're looking over, over 7,000 people. The NMA put out a terrific a document that where they looked at, you know, are there race, ethnicity differences and sex differences in this right. data, given this sample size and that messaging and what they found has to be communicated to the community by reputable members from the community. So what I would advocate in addition to finding your community stakeholders is that physicians need to work with the stakeholders and be with them at the table. Yes. Not, exactly. not say you take it, you say it. No, you need to be at the table and you need to be with the stakeholder and answer the questions because that then also helps the community leader to get their messaging out there. And I think all of us, as you said, have ties to the community. The hospitals, I believe, are doing a, a decent job in getting the messaging out now. Um, I can speak from, you know, here in Chicago, Rush has done a terrific job in getting the messaging out to the communities, what we know, what we don't know, what is a myth, what's not a myth. But it still doesn't take the responsibility off of us to make those messages heard. 
Um, yeah. One other thing, Sarah Lynn, um, as we talk about this diversity um, issue, it really is equity and getting an equitable message out. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm happy to see starting to be discussed are special populations, and especially in different ethnic groups where we know there are certain diseases. So, for example, in the African American community, sickle cell, right? right. Autoimmune, lupus, these kinds of things. Have you heard from other communities what's been happening in your, you know, in, in your meetings with the um, Native American community or the Hispanic community? Has certain things started to pop up where? It's becoming much more centric around what's affecting the communities with messaging. Well, I think right now the major concern is distribution and making sure that there's equitable distribution to get the vaccines there. I mean, we're operating on multiple fronts right now. It's getting the vaccine there and then getting individuals to come and take them. So we're I'm just starting to see it scale up. I think as we, um, and this is where I think AMWA can do a really amazing job to help partner um, to provide some of the, the scientific assistance here. Um, so I know there are efforts underway, but I, I just, I think it has to be bigger and bigger and bigger than what we can even begin to imagine. And part of that is think about when people go to get the flu vaccine, we have lessons learned from that, but now we're asking people to come back for a second shot. Exactly. And then we're dealing in a world of social media before we even get the messages, it's already out on TikTok and Twitter. And you know, I just, I have these nightmares at night. In fact, I'm starting to have my COVID dreams. My COVID nightmares are coming back again. And uh, in fact, I had one last night and it was, um, people were starting to complain of some of their side effects and it got out onto social media and then we were trying to counter it. And, you know, I just think we need to be ahead of the game and do it in a culturally competent way. You know, different communities um, have different words for pain and discomfort. Just like, you know, think about women's health. How do we identify hot flashes and certain communities identify it differently? We need to understand what each of these things mean. So that will be very important. And then we also need to reassure that you don't have COVID because some of these side effects are similar to what you would have with COVID. So we have a huge, huge, huge job. And, and I, I was looking at the bill that just got passed and I think there needs to be more assistance for our public health departments exactly. so that they can do this. So until that happens, it's organizations like AMWA partnering with its sister organizations to do that. Um, you talked about sex gender differences. This is really important too. First of all, we know that women make 80% of the healthcare decisions for themselves and their families. So there needs to be a huge effort. When I was looking at quickly at the data when they were doing the FDA hearings, I didn't see it disaggregated by sex in regard to side effects. And that really concerned me because we intuitively think women might, because of how robust our immune systems are, may need less vaccine to generate an effective immune response, which might mitigate some of our side effects. I didn't even see that. And again, I know there was, we're doing things quickly. There wasn't time. Maybe they're going to come back and do it. And I know that they were trying to get these responses for older individuals. But again, for younger populations, you might, it's kind of like the flu shot. We have larger doses for older individuals and smaller doses for the general population. We need to keep our eye on the ball and think we can get there. And I think, you know, there has been some initial data showing that men actually fare worse with COVID. That yes. Was it with a lot of the cardiovascular literature and what we yeah. were seeing. Even at, at our registries that we were looking at, at, you know, in Chicago, we were seeing that. So I think keeping the pulse on that and again, yeah. AMWA, the work that Eliza and, and the team has done with keeping that sex and gender lens there is terrific. One thing that has come up, there's a question, and again, I'd like to hear from our listeners on this. The question came up to me today was, I, you know, I work in a mobile, um, a mobile unit. Um, I provide care for my company. I am interfacing with patients, although we're mobile. When am I going to get the vaccine? And how do I even get it? How will I be told that my company will get the vaccine? And, and you know, the initial thought was, for me, was what about our medical societies? reaching out to them to see are they resources to know who can get what what would you suggest for these companies that are providing care you know think about home health nursing right, right. Companies. these are companies that are providing care how are they going to get the vaccine and so that they don't fall through the cracks any thoughts on that um what to tell these people in the field frankly yeah so each state operates slightly differently 
Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I have a connection from Colorado. So I've been listening to how they're going to do what they're doing and listening, of course, to DC where I'm located and Virginia and all the different jurisdictions around here. So they will have liaison connection to some of these organizations. So, uh, you know, they have this central registry and then individuals will be notified. Um, I think when we move it into the general population, that I'm trying to envision how we're going to do it because we're going to say to people, well, you go to your pharmacy, mm -hmm. um, you know, some primary, some docs who have, you know, primary responsibility might be able to administer some of the vaccines if they don't have the special freezers. But then there's a lot of paperwork with that. Right. And that's all we need as clinicians is more paperwork, but you've got to do the reporting. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to get done. I think right now we're being given a window of time to prepare. And I think that's something that AMWA, as AMWA, we can start to raise these mm -hmm. issues and these issues about where we foresee problems. And this is where we're going to hear need AMWA voices. Where are you practicing? Where are you at? And where do you see the problem? Because again, people on the ground can see where the bottlenecks are going to be. You know, whether it, and if it's going to come through the pharmacy, if it's going to come through a minute clinic, if it's going to come, but even scaling up is the big concern yeah. that we have, right? Um, the other question that came up, want to hear your thoughts. Um, you've been tested negative. So you've been getting testing and now you're positive. And the vaccine, so let's say you're, you know, you're a healthcare worker. Now the vaccine is coming to your place of work. What should you do? Do you yes. quarantine for that time? What we've been telling people is, you know, you're not having bad symptoms or do you take the vaccine? Yeah, so this is a question. It's a really great question. And again, it's going to evolve with time as we learn more and more. Uh, CDC was asked that on Friday mm -hmm. and they suggested that if you've had, if you've tested positive or if you've known you've had it, that about 90 days, because we think your antibodies should at least persist for 90 days. Mm -hmm. And right now, as we're in this sort of shortage of not being able to get the vaccine to everybody who needs it or wants it at the moment, that we're, you know, going to try to utilize everything that we can. And if you have antibodies, which we assume you will have, that you're probably good to go for about 90 days. Again, that will that will be more mature, and more nuanced as we get more data, but that's sort of the going thought right now. Okay. Yeah, 90 days. That, you know, that's the thing. And then, you know, the question also is those rapid tests that were done when people went out to get tested. See, we haven't even really talked about that. How many people got tested? And now, I'm, again, questions I get. Was that really an accurate test? I, I got yeah. my own test, but was that really accurate because it was in a hurry to get it out for tracking, but, you know, should I get the vaccine or not? And I think that brings up your comment about the risk benefit that everybody is going to make these decisions if there's not really guidelines that are understandable about when, when should you or when should you not or when should you consider, right? Um, but the rapid testing is a real big question people are asking about. So this is really a very good question. It was kind of the Wild West with testing. Um, one of the issues that has arisen is with these new variants that are arising. Mm -hmm. How will that impact your testing? So a lot of the sophisticated tests take into account multiple variables, multiple you know, antigens, multiple ways to uh, pick up the virus. But if you have a single test that doesn't, and then you're not picking it up, are you missing something? So again, these are important questions that, you know, we're in the middle of a scientific experiment right now. So we just don't know. My gut feeling is that the number of cases in this country is huge. We just haven't picked it all up because one, not everybody gets a test. It depends when you get tested, you could have a false negative. Um, I'm more concerned about the false negatives than I am concerned about the false positives. Right. So, you know, we have these two vaccines now. They're rolling out. Mm -hmm. They're going to be going at state level, right? So every state's going to be doing their thing on how mm -hmm. to have this roll out. What are your thoughts about more of these vaccines hitting the market? What are you thinking? What have you heard? Um, well, yeah, and there's several in the pipeline. Um, you know, Warp Speed has supported several of them. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, Pfizer vaccine didn't take federal government support for the development, but it was um, paid funding for the manufacturing distribution. 
Um, it's thought that J and J will probably have its data submitted by the, at some time at the end of January. Hopefully, we go for EUA in February. Okay. Um, it's a trial that stopped for a little while because they needed to investigate some adverse events, and then it restarted again. And so again, they think that that one would require just a single shot. Although I think they are testing two shots right now to see if they have any improved efficacy. Um, the AstraZeneca um, Oxford trial. Yeah. Um, again, you know, that's somewhat in the pipeline. There are several more. I mean, I think like with anything, as we move through the year, we'll probably have more and more vaccines and they'll be more sophisticated as we learn more and more about the reaction. Um, the challenge I have here <laughs> is that, you know, if you've gotten one vaccine, let's say you have to come back the next year for another or six months mm -hmm. later, is there going to be any kind of strange reaction if you take a different platform, use a different vaccine? You don't technically know, we assume you should probably keep the same track, but you don't quite know. Um, and, you know, it's one of the first times where, you know, we have multiple vaccines for against a single agent. Um, and so it, it is challenging. We're gonna have to be really clear in our registries and in our surveillance to know what we've got here. And then I think what, if there is any excitement is maybe we'll evolve into a world of precision medicine mm -hmm. that, you know, depending on the, um, the, the type of vaccine and the, uh, the status of its side effects or its efficacy, you might be a better candidate for one over another. And I think that would be you know, an exciting finding because the one thing with, with this pandemic is it's really revolutionized our approach to medical care. And you know, we realize you know, the timing and, and the amount um, of medication that you give plays an important role. For example, what we learned with steroids, better to give it at a later phase than the earlier phase, for example, or your antibodies earlier than later. Well, I, I think you did terrific, terrific and I was going to transfer over to you, Eliza, to see if yeah. you had any thoughts and questions because there's so many things we put out right okay. now to get everyone thinking about things outside of the media. So what questions do you have for us? Yeah, we've got some great questions from the audience. And just a reminder to everyone, you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, but the first question we have is, um, you guys touched on the fact that there are two vaccines. And um, our docs are getting asked by their community um, which one to take when it's made available. Is there a choice? And just wondering if you guys want to comment on that. I can comment. I'm taking what Rush is telling me to take. And, and honestly, that's what we got. We got Pfizer. I'll be getting the vaccine tomorrow. That's all that we have right now coming to us because that was already distributed. <laughs> so Sarah Lynn. Yeah, so I contacted the DC Department of Health tonight about when they were gonna get the Moderna vaccine. <laughs> and they came back with the, uh, the same response. We get what we get and we'll yeah. take what we have if you choose you to take a vaccine. <laughs> right, so yeah, it's all a question of what is it would have sent mm -hmm. out. Yeah, I don't think people are going to have a, you know, a menu to choose from at this, at this time. Yeah, that's a good question, Eliza, because you know, I'm just thinking ahead how distribution goes with the companies and your health insurance. Oh, my gosh. It, it's a great question, Whitten. We don't know. Yeah. No. I think but my gut, my gut feeling is that the uh, Pfizer vaccine will probably go into health systems that have the special freezers. And then for community physicians and more rural communities, you probably will get more of the Moderna yeah, vaccine because yeah. of the ease of, um, of, of distribution. Yeah. 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 Right. And I think that the record keeping is going to be important so that the, the second vaccine um, mm -hmm. makes sure you get the same, the same kind. Um, another really great question, um, recommendations regarding masks and social distancing for those who have been successfully vaccinated with the two doses. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing until I hear otherwise. And, I, and I'm saying that, and again, I don't want to be a little bit glib on this, but I'm saying that just to be smart. We don't, you know, no one likes wearing them. I don't like wearing a face shield when I'm seeing patients in the outpatient setting and I'm not doing any kind of specimen anything. I will do this as long as I need to and until I hear otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it comes back down to the point that <clears throat> we do not know the durability. I mean, it's yeah. the, the D's. We don't know the durability and the duration of the immune response. Um, we also don't know if you can shed. So the other side, you know, individual use like new and, and I just, I just, I just think when it comes to my as far as lifestyle, you know, I you went know, over to Asia after the SARS outbreak and I was so Sorry, I think we're hearing static. 
Um, I, yeah, I was in Asia in you know early 2000s after the SARS outbreak and everyone was wearing face masks and it was sort of shocking for me. And then I just realized it became part of the culture. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, it's now become a fashion statement and, and yes, they're not the most comfortable, but they're your protection. They're your shield right now. We're all warriors and this is your body armor. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, one comment, uh, Dr. Nicole Sandu, um, our president wanted to say thank you to both of you for this excellent discussion. Just wanted to pass that on. Um, there's another question or, or comment asking if you can maybe, you know, um, again, as women physicians, we play an important role on education. And I think, uh, Dr. Mark, you touched on this a little bit about warning about the side effects of uh, the vaccine that could be confused with actually being COVID. Um, can you go over a little bit about that education process? And sorry about my dog here. <laughs> Well, and I, I remember your dog, and I, <laughs> he brings a smile to our faces. So thank you for including him in this discussion. Um, and and I I think you know it just reminds us that we all need to stay com- you know com- connected. Um, you know, it's really there are some fine lines. You know, so it would be unusual to lose your sense of taste and smell, which is what you see with COVID. Probably you shouldn't be having upper respiratory symptoms such as a dry cough. Um, but again, it's not to say that you can't have both, where you could be vaccinated and be exposed either the day before or day after and, and still have both. So we have to stay on our toes. Neelam, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm going to go neuro here, everybody, and I'm telling you neuro, anything that resembles a TIA or a stroke, that needs to be examined, okay? And the messaging, especially here, and I've been doing a lot of the messaging in Chicago about going over the signs of stroke, the fast signs, where you have the confusion, you have the facial droop, you have any of these things that happen, that is an emergency that needs to be really looked at and not saying, oh, it'll, I'll ride this out, okay? Um, the other things that are coming up from a neuro perspective that we're looking at in addition to the myalgias, we are getting quite a bit of this, with COVID even, this long hauler fog. The brain mm-hmm. fog is coming up much more. Uh, we're seeing it much more now. People are complaining with the constellation with COVID uh, infection. So with the vaccine, if there's anything that doesn't go, you know, go away within two days with the myalgia or you're not feeling mm-hmm. quite right, that's when you need to honestly start talking to your primary care or the ER and letting them know the ERs are also ramping up quite a bit now thinking about this because they're going to have to start triaging some of these side effects. And Sarah Lynn, what you mentioned, having that call in, right? Call in, when should we start to get concerned or when should we just say, stay home and, you know, um, take, get the fever down, take a Tylenol, those kinds of things we're going to have to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very important. The other thing, um, Neelan, I'm curious about like drug drug interactions. You know, we have older individuals and they have multiple medications, yeah. polypharmacy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how are we going to assess, you know, that in, in the midst of that? That, that concerns me too. It, it's really tough, you know. Um, and yeah, the polypharmacy is a huge issue because it's not only the missing, it's the doubling up on doses right. that I'm worried about. Um, and then you have this on top of it and not, sh- not knowing, not knowing mm-hmm. what's causing what, um, right. this is again, many older people are living alone. This is this right. myth that people always are living with, you know, in many cases there are families, but in a lot of people, I don't know, Sarah Lynn, it's a good question. Eliza, you see a lot of older adults in the sense of how do we handle this? Just being a good sleuth and trying to figure out, get collateral information from people was something off? Did she take the medicine? Didn't she? What happened um, after the vaccine was given? Um, you know, what, was there confusion? Those kinds of things. It's going to be hard. So mm-hmm. trying to think of solutions, we're identifying this can be an issue. And I'm, I'm concerned that older individuals, they take, let's say, their second dose and they actually have a good response. Yeah. So they may find one of the issues is extraordinary fatigue. And some of the reports that I've read is that individuals don't even feel they can get out of bed to even make a meal. And let's say you're a diabetic. 
is there a way that medical societies could create support groups so that somebody who's got, they know that you've gotten a vaccine and you're being checked on kind of yeah. safety check. And if you're not answering the phone, that somebody goes to the door to find out if you will even answer by the, you know, just stand by the door to say you're okay, just to make sure people are okay. This is where I get concerned. You know, again, it'd be great to hear from our listeners if they have any mm -hmm. ideas. I can tell you what's been happening and I'm involved with studies that are looking at people who've had, let's say, are COVID positive, recovered and following them while they're at home by phone calls. Just how are you doing? Mm -hmm. So they're doing mm -hmm. these quick touch based calls. I'm wondering right. if we should start be thinking of a design where now following people who got the vaccine. Yes, I wish we could do that. And, and it's in a way perfect surveillance as well. Exactly. Because exactly. They may not even register that, oh, I just felt exhausted today and I couldn't make a meal, but that actually might be a side effect of the vaccine. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that'd be just important too. Just a phone call mm -hmm. and you know, phone, a, call. A phone call, it doesn't have to be video conferencing because again, you know, the more we consider always video conferencing, that's an equity, that's an equity issue. Not that's everybody right. has that. And right. we have to understand in our communities of color, in a minoritized communities, that's not there. But the phone, for the most part, is. And yeah. just to do that touch base, I think, would be doable. And if we could design that or promote that, that could, I think, would be very helpful, Carolyn. And I think yeah. that would give good information. Yeah, on both sides. Yeah. 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 Do you have any other questions, Eliza, that you see coming through? Um, so here's um, here's one question. Uh, you know, um, the initial rollout, of course, is mostly to healthcare, and I think a lot of other people are wondering how will I find out. Um, similarly, you know, some docs in private practice, yeah. you know, how will they get notified? Is it through the hospital affiliation? And and so, you know, um, just wondering if you had any comments about that. And I think that goes back to. Um, uh, Sarah Lynn, what you were saying about kind of, you know, public health messaging and making sure mm -hmm. that there's a clear messaging process. So I, I'm thinking the medical societies are going to be stepping up here quite a bit. And are, um, if not, that's an opportunity for AMWA to raise awareness to this question about how will we be notified. M uh, many docs do belong to some society or at least know of someone who is belonging to that society and could possibly mm -hmm. opt in to get an email that this is, you know, this is where we're at, this is where the vaccine is going to be. Um, but I do think that's a great question. And if we could have almost like an org chart, a chart of where it should be going, or at least put it out there where we think it should go, I think that would be helpful. But I'm saying medical societies, the local medical societies, or the hospital that you practice, or you practice through, or you admit to, possibly that hospital system could pick that up. So completely agree with that. I think our departments of health, you know, physicians are licensed, will be reaching out to notify you so that you can then begin notifying your patients. But again, I'm really concerned because not everybody out there has a physician, you know, in our underserved communities mm -hmm. who are so, so vulnerable. How do we get to them? And this is where I think we're going to have to work with local community groups a little more effectively. And they are going to actually have to become almost a medical in a sense, triage area who in their communities that they see um, who are coming in in their shelters or their food banks that they need to ensure. And then that's the other challenge. Like, how do you get them back so right. that they know in 21 days or 28 days? And if they don't, well, there'll be follow up. I want to see answers to this. This right. terrifies me that the undercurrent of what we're doing is for that higher level of medical care, but it's another level of medical care that is so critical to our country that will not be served appropriately. I wanna have answers to that. You know, interesting, Sarah Lynn, it's an interesting thing that the COVID pandemic exposed what we yes. all do, right? The fracture, right. the brokenness of the system, and now the vaccine is exposing right. it again because now we're trying to say we have something but we don't have the distribution channels. We don't have the infrastructure. We have a lot of questions at this point. And I think it's an opportunity for us to say, okay, now we have something, but we mm -hmm. also now have to figure this out. I do think um, working in the communities here, you know, the health ministries and a lot of the churches are very well developed. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we have devoted people, we have nurses, 
We have retired nurses who work in a lot of these health ministries. A lot of physicians go there for whether it be their place of worship. That could be something to think about because this is really activating and, and really galvanizing communities with the correct information and data, but also the means of how to deliver. I think we should really start thinking about these community organizations. Yeah, and, and press for answers, not when we get to it, we'll talk about it. Yeah, not yeah, acceptable. Exactly. Yeah. Great. We've got some other really great questions. Um, uh, one question is about different groups of folks getting vaccinated, um, mm -hmm. pregnant women, youth, uh, if you can comment on that. And another one is um, uh, what role can the primary care physician um, play in ensuring that people go back for their second vaccination? So Sarah Lynn, why don't you take, I think you mentioned already the pregnant women uh, yeah. coming out about this right now. Why don't you take that and I can um, start to tackle the youth uh, a little bit, even though I deal with older adults, but I deal with their youth, <laughs> their grandchildren. So go ahead. Yeah, so there was um, public discussion during the FDA uh, hearings on both these agents, and people brought up this point that we hadn't appropriately studied. Um, Moderna talked about having a global registry and that there would begin just some discussion about some trials. But again, when I heard the CDC on Friday, they said that we recommend pregnant women to get the vaccine, that groups such as um, ACOG and others had decided that the risk of developing COVID was so significant that there was a benefit to getting the vaccine um, because preterm delivery, you know, preterm labor is seen with patients with COVID. Um, there were issues regarding um, uh, everything across the pregnancy in regard to some, you know, side effects from just um, not from doing nothing. So the challenge we have here is we just don't know. And one of my concerns is that, you know, because we can see fever as a potential side effect from the vaccine, and we know fever during a pregnancy can have adverse complications, not only, you know, the pregnancy itself, but the fetus. Um, how are we addressing that? Are we going to pre-medicate? So with, you know, antipyretic, how are we following? I think, again, it comes to the risk-benefit analysis. If you're on the front line, so your risk is so high, it may be a benefit to get the vaccine. But again, individual decision with the physician that you're working with, if you are connected to a physician or your midwife or whoever your clinician is, this is an area that really, really, really scares me. Um, and, and I find it, and I understand, again, because of the time period, we didn't do it. We needed to go to sort of the low-hanging fruit. But it, it, this, to me, is another inequity that we see for women in healthcare, um, deemed a special population, but it's not. So I really wish there had been greater effort to this so we had a better understanding. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, the hypercoagulable state, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have a COVID infection... And this is going back to the strokes that we were seeing, mm -hmm. stroke in the young. That was the very first thing we started to see with COVID, that our stroke admissions were, were really going down, yet the mm -hmm. young stroke admissions were going up. Mm -hmm. And not just one stroke, multiple strokes, people coming in and my colleagues would be saying, we've never, you know, we haven't seen this um, occurring in this younger group. And now you have, let's say, a COVID infection in, in a pregnant woman and I'm worrying about showering and, and stroke and, and everything that goes with that. So it, I think this is gonna be a really tough decision about you know, getting a vaccine or not. We're going to have to keep pressing for more data and, and really trying to figure out how to manage this. The younger groups is also quite a challenge because a lot of the younger groups here, or patients in this case, um, feel that you know, I'm immune to this and we're seeing case after case after case. No, no, you're not. Um, if you get COVID, you will not just have a flu and get over it. You can have a bad outcome. Um, I do think when I look at the list of the tier approach, I do understand the younger people are at the bottom, if you will, of the, that tier approach. And I think right now, because it is going to be um, a limited number of um, vials coming out, if you will, that that makes sense. What I want to address, though, is what do we do with our residents our medical student and residents that are in the hospital that are in some cases M3s, M4s, still front, you know, essential workers, how are we handling that? Do we have, you know, how's that being looked at um, in yeah. getting, getting the vaccine? 
So I talked to a couple of my residents um, at different hospitals and they are on the list. If they're coming onto the wards, they're getting them sooner than those who are doing electives where they're not having clinical interface. So they are being considered. I know there was a lot of discussion certainly after the whole Stanford incident. So again, the issue of equity. Um, coming back to sex differences in pregnancy, it's really fascinating. You know, we saw this with H1N1 back in 2009, where women had higher rates of morbidity, pregnant women higher rates of morbidity and mortality. We believe women tend to be more resistant to infection, but once they're infected, they mount very robust responses. But you lose that when you're pregnant, of course, not to reject the fetus. And you certainly have that resistance pattern of respiration. And, and yet when we see women who've been um, put on ventilators, they've done very poorly and they have higher mortality rates with COVID. So this is a really challenging situation. And again, looking at um, the amount of vaccine you might need, taking into account the hormonal milieu that you're operating in and also the immune system that you're operating in. I think we really need to, just this one size fits all really concerns me because it's a very different interface here. So to be determined, I guess, at the moment. So we're at the top of the hour, but I just wanted to circle back to one last question related. You talked a little bit about residents and medical students. Of course, we have a large group of medical students and one has put a question in the chat. Um, and many medical students aren't on a, a list currently, at least that's what the student's reporting. And so what are your thoughts there? And if you can comment a little bit. It's, yeah, I, I, I can just tell you about the medical students not being on the list. I'm monitoring it just locally, what's happening. M1, you know, again, on the list, and are you an M4, M3, M2, M1? Um, M1s aren't in, in hospital, very limited interactions, even coming in with masks on. Um, M2s have limited, it's M3s and M4s. And I guess it's going to really depend on how much interaction you have on the floors and what you're going to be asked to do. It seems almost sterile in. It's like the state thing, right? With the rollout, right. every medical school, every region of the country is going to be having different things mm -hmm. that students are going to be doing. And maybe, you know, that's what we need to realize and start making contingency about, you know, when should you be have, when should you be offered this? Um, and what's yeah. the situation? It's really been fascinating. I went to NYU Medical School, and as we recall back in March, um, our students were graduating very quickly and they were getting onto the wards. It was really all hands on deck. And unfortunately, as we're reaching surge capacity across the United States, as we come into some of these, you know, pretty dark days, we may be engaging more of our medical students, our nurse practitioner students earlier than we thought, you know, across the gamut, our nursing students, really all our health teams. Um, one idea that I really liked, I read about at Stanford that some of the docs there, um, if they weren't in active practice, but yet they were on the list, what they did is they grabbed a student that they had worked with and had them come and the student got the vaccine who was actually going to be engaged in clinical care. Right. So they just sort of took it into their own hands where, you know, they helped to ensure it. So I think having some fluidity and flexibility is really important. And I, I just want to come back to something. Um, I was offered a vaccine on Monday. And I'm not going to be back in any clinical setting for several weeks. And so I, I actually turned it down and said, please give it to someone who needs it immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we did that, of course, we all want to be protected. We want to do what we can. But if, because we're in this pandemic, if people can think about their own setting, if they're, if they're working from home, if they're doing telemedicine calls, even if they're on the list, but they're not gonna be really interfacing. Again, the whole world is the potential exposure, but in regard to that clinical setting, maybe defer it and, and see if it can go to someone who, whether it be a student, resident, whoever, essential worker, whoever is working to be able to, to get assistance. Right, and that's terrific. And I think that's another opportunity, right, Eliza, that we would have to start putting these ideas forward. You know, here's what we've seen, here's the issue. Here's a potential solution and or under consideration, mm -hmm. an issue consideration, because it really mm -hmm. isn't all hands on deck here to see how we're going to make this work. Um, mm -hmm. I do have one question, Eliza, if I can, before I close and I'll let you close up. And Sarah Lynn, we were talking about the global piece. We haven't really brought this in here, but mm -hmm. globally there is vaccine developments around the world. And mm -hmm. one of the questions I get always is, how do those vaccines compare to what we're doing here? And those vaccines are in, in different ethnic groups, different countries. 
well, does it make sense to get the vaccine from the country of origin that I may be from? Because <laughs> there could be some kind of benefit to that versus getting something American made, if you will. And I, I just want you to think about it. I know it's a big question, but it, it has come up quite a bit um, in some of the discussions yeah. that I've had. It's interesting. We were talking about that yesterday as well. So for example, should UK use the AstraZeneca one when that comes online and should Germany use the Pfizer one when that comes online? You know, again, it's sort of a, a, a global public health yeah. challenge and, you know, we use what we have available. I think the bigger question is how do we ensure that countries that are developing nations that have had challenges with their healthcare system are at the table and they get vaccines. And I think that's where every nation really needs to, to make that a priority because we are a global community. We're not gonna close our borders forever. And we need to ensure that every population has it. I know a lot of nonprofits have been really focused on that, for example, the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. So I think we as clinicians, I know um, AMWA has partnered with our international um, phys female physician associations. I'd like to have that discussion because I think it's gonna be extraordinarily important if we're gonna get control of this pandemic. I agree, I agree. And yeah, thanks, Sarah So Eliza, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Um, since we're at the, over the top of the hour. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Well, I just wanted to thank you both so much. You brought up such uh, amazing points and I guess that kind of the big take home and maybe you know what you planted the seed, um, Sarah Lynn, is that we need to be um, speaking not just within our country, but you know globally well, and mm -hmm. engaging those conversations. And most importantly, that as women physicians, uh, medical students, and even our pre-medical students um, can be and should be ambassadors of the yeah. message to um, inform the public, um, give you know the reassuring uh, um, points, and um, you know encourage um, uh, vaccination uh, so that we can um, recover from this pandemic and move on. So okay. thank you both so much for your time, your expertise tonight. Um, we will follow up with all the attendees and those who signed up. Thank you thank all, you. and have a wonderful holiday. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Be you. well. Thanks.